Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, mainly retinal dystrophies. I don't. We usually don't have time to go through re retinal and macular dystrophies, both macular dystrophies and retinal dystrophies in the same one. But for those of you who've been in my clinic, uh, you know that there's that I'm the main referral person for the Intermountain West, really for all for retinal degenerations. So I'm going to give you my <clears throat> approach to how I deal with these patients and uh, and get them uh, get them the care that they need. And you'll see that uh, they do take a little they take a lot more time than an average retina patient. And when they come in. The way I run my clinic, I try to have, I'm working on trying to adjust my clinic so that I see one, uh, one new retinal dystrophy patient per clinic, not two or three as they sometimes try to put into my clinic. And as you'll also see when you come into my clinic that we, we're trying to get them to come in early at the beginning of the clinic because <laughs> typically their workup before they're even ready to see me can be three to four hours. and so. They need to be, this is every bit as bad as neuro-op clinic, I think. Um, and they, uh, so we have to really allow that. The patients need to be aware. And a lot of the patients that are coming in to see me have already seen three, maybe four eye care specialists. They've seen their optometrists. They've seen ophthalmologists. And a lot of, and they've gotten, by the time they've reached me, they've had, they have a lot of misinformation, a lot of apprehension. They generally have been reading on the internet already and reading a lot of, getting, you know, seeing a lot of variability. Actually, most of the stuff on the internet is probably pretty depressing for them to look at. And so we have to give them some hope, and so I try to do that. Plus, there's a lot of misinformation, as we'll see on the internet, too, that gives them false hopes and can take, uh, can take their money and can take and give them essentially bad care and perhaps even put them at risk. So these patients just take a lot of extra time. It's when I came here 21 years ago, that was one of the reasons I was brought on is that I did, I did have at least a reasonable expertise in the, in the, uh, in the care of these patients and uh, was willing to take them on as part of, as part of my uh, reason for coming out here. So we'll get started here. And there are a variety of retinal dystrophies that I see. Uh, the ones that are, pro are the most common include retinitis pigmentosa, and we will go into that more in detail. There are syndromic retinopathies, which means that's retin retinitis pigmentosa or similar diseases plus other systemic manifestations. I would say compared to some of my colleagues at other institutions, I don't have as many as you would expect as as other other institutions have, and that just uh, that may be just the referral pattern here. It may be the way the just the genetic population here, but there isn't there aren't most of the cases that we'll see in my clinic are pure ocular diseases. Are not uh, with the exception, uh, unless you want to talk about things like Usher disease or things that have just one other manifestation like, like hearing loss. But in terms of real, uncommon, rare, multi-system diseases, probably you're, you're not gonna see a lot of them in my clinic. The other one that I surprisingly see very few of are stationary retinopathies. This is things like congenital stationary night blindness. And I'm kind of mystified at that. If you talk to, if I talk to my other colleagues, I don't see, I just don't get that many referrals. Don Creel is very good, is a very good electroretinographer, and some of these have very characteristic patterns, but I just don't see them very much. And maybe I'm, mis I'm underdiagnosing them or missing the diagnoses or people don't complain enough. But stationary retinopathies mean that they have some sort of manifestation similar to retinitis pigmentosa in terms of poor dark adaptation, other, um, other problems like that but they don't get worse, as opposed to RP, by definition, pure retinitis pigmentosa is, is a disease that will get worse. Um, then cone dystrophies, which we'll get to uh, later on in the talk, I would say are very common here in Utah. They are, but they tend to be not, they tend to be macular cone dystrophies. I see a lot of these that are kind of hard to diagnose. They tend to not have good genetic diagnoses. But, um, but, are, but are, they tend to be atypical here would be my, my impression. 
Uh, toxic retinopathies, you always have to keep in mind. They, I've picked up a, num a number of those through the years where you just have to, where you see a retinitis pigmentosa or some other retinal degeneration that just doesn't totally make sense. And uh, you, then you do a little more, more of a history, take, make sure that you do uh, occupational histories, uh, histories of joint implants, other things like that. You may pick up some toxic retinopathies, is basically what, what I'm pointing out. And you also want to do a good drug history. And then there are pseudo-retinopathies, which means that they look like retinitis pigmentosa uh, or similar diseases, but they don't have, uh, but they're not inherited and they often are somewhat atypical in that they may be unilateral and they may be post-inflammatory or some other problem. And we'll go into all of these in more detail. So retinitis pigmentosa is a disease that you will see uh, if you spend a little bit of time in my clinic. The estimated prevalence in the United States and elsewhere and worldwide is about one in 3,000 people are affected. So that means there are over 100,000 people affected in Utah. And if there are 3 million people in Utah, we're talking about, I think, what does that make? A, make about 1,000 people with retinitis pigmentosa here, here in Utah. And this is the most common inherited form of blindness that, you'll, that is found. And there's a large variety of inheritances. We'll go through that. Essentially, every type of inheritance has been described with retinitis pigmentosa type syndromes. And the, they also have a very, they have a large clinical, variety of clinical courses and genetic causes. So that's an important thing just to keep in mind. Patients who come in with the diagnosis of RP are going, you know, they, they will have read on the internet and they will see RP is a blinding disease. They, they claim, and I don't know if this is really, really true, but they often say that their doctors said, yep, you have retinitis pigmentosa, you're going to be blind in five years, and then just walks out. I hear that story all the time. And so hopefully uh, the people in this room will not do that and understand that there's a lot, a lot of variety, and either you need to know what you're talking about or you need to, re need to show some compassion and, re and refer them on to someone who knows what, what really is going on with the disease. And the problem has been and still is, is that there's very limited interventions that are truly effective and available for the patients. So patients with RP, their class, when I take the history, their classic uh, complaint is usually night blindness. And that, that they can talk about, they often say that's been true all of their lives or since they were, since they were very young, that they just didn't see as well as their, as their compatriots at night. And they tended to have more light on at night that there's just something different about, and their parents may say that there's just something different about this child compared to other children that they have. And that's, and it may not be all that bad, but uh, that, that's the first sign. And then the next sign that the patients usually have, if they have classic RP, is that they start developing manifestations of, of decreased visual field loss, or de decreased visual field. And if they have this, they may have more trouble in sports. They may be bumping into, into people and things more than, more than you would expect. And then, but on the other hand, for pure retinitis pigmentosa, the central visual acuity and cone function is generally preserved until late in the course of the disease. So patients with classic RP typically will have 20-20 vision. Even into the ver in, even into at the at the point that they are legally blind with fields less than 20 degrees in each eye, so unless they have macular edema or other problems, they the central vision is uh, typically preserved, but the, there's always exceptions, and they may eventually have they they eventually um, may, will have have loss of central vision, plus they will also have um, there are also the things that are cone rod dystrophies, rod cone dystrophies, where the cone system is also involved. Eventually, and this is the scary part for the patients, is that the end stage can include no light perception. So there's not a lot of diseases that we deal with. You know, much more commonly in my clinic, I'm dealing with macular degeneration where I, I can assure patients unless there's something really unusual, they're going to have their peripheral vision, they're going to be able to see, um, see the big picture of things. Retinitis pigmentosa is a disease that, that has a very scary outcome if it goes to its end stage. 
And after you've taken a history and found out that the, that the patient has, symptom, uh, has at least symptoms that are consistent with RP, we take a look at the patient and look for, for the classic signs of retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, the pigment of retinitis pigmentosa are bone spicules, and that's shown, let's see if I can do this without, yeah, so the, these kind of clumpy uh, pigment that, sometimes, that, doesn't necess that can follow blood vessels but doesn't always. It's typically in the mid-periphery here. There can be, uh, there's a lot of different manifestations. Some patients have dense, you know, almost confluent bone spicules here. Other ones may have just a few little patches is all that you'll see as manifestation of their RP. And uh, there are some cases of RP uh, that where there's no, no pigment at all. So it's not, it doesn't have to be present. The other thing that you'll see is peripheral retinal atrophy the uh, pigmentation, the choroidal pigmentation that you see here just doesn't look quite as uniform as you would expect and you see, uh, you see down to, to, the, uh, down to the, the choroid a little bit better than you would expect. There is waxy pallor of the optic disc and occasionally optic nerve head drusen. So waxy pallor means that there's, it's pale and it just doesn't have the vasculature, it just doesn't have just doesn't have a, 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 a real normal look to it. And optic nerve head drusen can be found, uh, it's, I've heard it claimed up to 20% or so that if you really look for them to have that. And then there is classically vascular attenuation, shown here, and uh, you often see vitreous cells. Now these are not inflammatory cells, this is often just little bits of degenerative tissue that gets off into the vitreous. But that can be confusing if you're, if you're worrying about an inflammatory disease that is doing the same process. Um, then posterior subcapsular cataracts are surprisingly common in these patients. That's the most common cataract that I see. They happen at a relatively young age in these patients. I often see them in their 20s, 30s with a posterior subcapsular cataract. And you have to be at least thinking about whether these are visually significant. Remember, a patient with RP has a very restricted visual field, sometimes only 20 degrees, and a posterior subcapsular cataract that, that would be pretty much asymptomatic to a normal, normal seeing individual may be visually significant if it's just right in the center, which they surprisingly often are. And it's been shown through many studies that, that patients with RP do very well with cataract surgery. And so it's not a re having RP is not a reason to, ha to avoid doing cataract surgery. They're not at any higher risk of complications or any other, you know, there are any other reasons to avoid doing cataract surgery. On the other hand, you have to go in with the fact that they do have a problem in the retina. And so you have to, you have, to have the patients go in with reasonable expectations that you're not gonna cure their RP that there's a possibility you may be wrong and that it's not as visually significant as you thought. And they, so there are a fair number of disappointed patients if you don't prepare them for that. Uh, cystoid macular edema is quite common in these patients and was probably underdiagnosed until we got into the OCT era. Now that we have OCT, it's pretty standard on, that's part of the standard workup of all my RP patients is to do an OCT because I, I miss it clinically but if, they, if a patient comes in with classic looking RP, uh, say as a 15 year old kid and comes in with, with classic RP but has 2050, 2060 vision, think cystoid macular edema in these patients and be sure to have an OCT because that can be treatable uh, with either with dorzolo dorzolamide topically or Dimox uh, orally and you can help them improve their vision. So, yes. Uh, they generally are not, and they're kind of whitish in, in what, I, what I see, but you probably could see pigmented, but they can be confused, and they sometimes, some of these patients come in and, into the uveitis clinic, and so you do, they can be almost anything, but I generally say they're not pigmented. Um, and as we mentioned, the macula is preserved until late in the course of the disease. That's the last place, that's the last place that usually goes in, a, in, a, in RP. So, when a patient comes in to see me, what do they have to do for their three or four hours before they see me? Well, we're supposed to, get the, you wanna get a clinical history. 
did they start with night blindness at a young age? Do they have, um, is it, does the progression, you know, you, if you have someone who's come in and says things have gone bad in six months, you have to think about, and that they had perfectly normal vision before, that doesn't rule out RP, but at least makes you think about something else going on. But uh, typically the course is pretty slow, that they say, and this has been progressing. Um, you, the average age that I would diagnose patients are in childhood or young adulthood, but I have diagnosed newly, newly, newly diagnosed patients all the way up until their 70s or 80s. There's some patients that have mild enough disease that they don't manifest and don't complain about the problems until late, very late in life, so it doesn't totally rule it out. But the more typical patient coming in is, is school age or young adulthood. Uh, you want to get a good family history. Uh, and this is, we're trying, we currently don't have a genetic counselor anymore, so I'm the one and my technicians that need to do this. I don't, it's hard to get a good, to take the time to get a good family history, but at least I take a limited one and ask, do you have any cousins with any eye problems? Tell me about your parents. Tell me about, if you're an adult, tell me about what's going on with your kids and your siblings and find out just to see if there's anyone else with even vaguely similar eye problems within the, within the family. You then need to do a dilated retina examination and photography. This, the basic imaging that I do for my patients coming in includes uh, fundus photographs and I'm trying to drill into my technicians and the photographers that if there's a patient with RP, it's useless to me to give me a, fun, a macular photo. They, and it's amazing how the photographers still don't get it at all, after all this time. But if it says RP on it, that automatically means I want a peripheral shots, whether with the optos or uh, montage, shot, montage shots. I also want to get, I get autofluorescence routinely because uh, there's often a lot of autofluorescent abnormalities that can bring out some of the, the, the changes in the, in the mid periphery versus what's going on in the macula. Um, we'll get infrared, OCT, all of the basic what I call non-invasive imaging. Uh, a fluorescent angiogram is not, not typically something I would get unless, until after I've seen the patient and really looked. Uh, if there's something unusual, then of course I would get that if there's evidence of other of vascular problems or something else unusual. Visual field testing, this is done a little bit out of order, but visual field testing is very important. And in my opinion, uh, Goldman fields are the gold standard still. Manual gold fields, the Goldman fields are the ones to do. The Humphrey visual fields that we get don't go out far enough. You really want to know what's going on in the mid periphery all the way out on these patients. And so that's, um, that's important. We do have the, um, the Octopus 900, which is an automated uh, Goldman visual field. These are usually kinetic, as you know, and, uh, but it does both kinetic and static wide field. The technicians hate it, and the patients hate it too, because it takes, it takes a long time to do that test. It can be 30 minutes of testing per eye on these patients. And so we got the, Oct the Octopus 900 for clinical studies when we were doing some of our RP studies. You need to have something quantitative and less subjective than a Goldman visual field. But uh, the machine, and the machine breaks down a lot. And that it used to do, especially in the clinical studies, they would go through their 20 or 30 minutes test and then it would just burp and throw away the data and then they'd have to start again. So um, that's, it's not a, ha it's not a well-loved machine. We mentioned already optical coherence tomography and then genetic testing is becoming more and more part of the, the general workup in my patients. The problem has been, and I think it may have, it may have it some more on some of the slides, there's a huge number of genetic genetic diseases out there and the genetic testing was it tended to be very expensive up until recently and took forever uh, if you if you got the free testing through the iGene uh, project which is no no longer accepting patients but that was through the NIH we would draw the blood and you'd never hear anything back for years and I just have to tell the patients you get what you paid for you didn't pay for anything for this they will get back to you when they feel like it but uh, I had to really go through a lot with my technicians and the schedulers here because until we had this long talk with the patients about what iGene testing was about, they would start calling after two weeks asking, well, what are the results of my test? And then 
the schedulers would get upset and they'd start paging me and paging the resident on call. Why don't we have the result back? And I finally had to tell them, you're likely never to hear anything from this test. And so, and the tech, finally they stopped calling me about this and as emergency results that needed to be found. The good news is that genetic testing currently is free. Now, if you have a typical rod cone, rod, rod mediated disease like RP, we have a program that I don't know when it's going to go away, but one of the genetic testing companies called, um, called Spark, which is uh, developing gene therapy, is taking any and all comers. So I can send tests for free, and they haven't gotten back to me yet, but they will get, they think, they will test for the common genes for RP and get back to us within a month or two. So that's kind of nice. Before, and now if you were to send your, your testing to, or your blood to somewhere like you know, University of Oregon or Oregon Health Sciences where we send it or to the Carver Lab at University of Iowa, they will also get back pretty quickly but they will charge anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000. And currently, almost no insurance companies will pay for it. So it's out of pocket to the patients. And we'll talk about why we should do that in some of the future slides here. So electroretinography is, the, is something that we recommend highly in the patients. That's part of the baseline workup of the patients. I'm sure Don Creel has talked to you about electroretinography. So, and I am no expert on electroretinograms. That's, uh, that's his field. But what we're looking at is you want to see the function of their rods and cones. In typical RP, the, the, the scotopic system is going to be affected much worse, much earlier. In, um, they will, and in most cases of RP, it will be abnormal before they have any major clinically relevant symptoms. And it's very common in these patients when, when you see them that they are, that, they're, that the ERG may be already extinguished from the start by the time they're diagnosed. Even though they may be functional, driving, still working, the ERG can be pretty difficult to, uh, or can be very low. Typically the rods, the cone system will have some minor changes, some changes in, in implicit time, but will be much more, much more functional than the rod system. And it's important to do electroretinography not only for baseline diagnosis, but you can pick up unusual, uh, unusual ones like congenital stationary night blindness, rod monochromatism. You can also, there were, it can help distinguish uh, cone dystrophies from retinitis pigmentosa, and sometimes you'll see mixed you know, that they tend to be a cone rod or rod cone dystrophy. So again, this is just kind of the typical things that we would see. I want to go back one, I think. Oh, let's see. And visual fields, the Goldman visual field, the classic things you're going to find is initially some generalized constriction. You will also see mid-peripheral visual field loss, these scotomas here that can form into what the classic ring, ring scotoma. And eventually, as you can see in a patient, this one is just uh, autosomal dominant RP followed for 30, I guess 40 years here. You can go from a pretty functional visual field all the way to you know, totally dysfunctional visual field, but maybe still with 20-20 vision. The other thing that's important when I order a Goldman visual field, and again, it's surprising how the technicians just don't get this, is that a Goldman visual field in an RP patient, with, unless there's some, unusual, some exceptions, should include not only each eye, and I don't really care if they're dilated or not. You know, it doesn't matter that much for, um, for what I'm trying to get in the clinic because sometimes, somehow a patient gets, gets into my clinic they're already dilated. I diagnose, well, this really looks like RP. I need a Goldman visual field. I'm not going to send them back and bring them back a different day. I just tell the technicians, just go ahead and use what we have. The other thing that's really important is to get a binocular visual field. Because these patients, uh, many of them are teenagers, young adults. They're out there driving or want to drive. That's the, one of their major questions that they're asking me is, can I still drive, doc? And if I don't, if I have just monocular visual fields, I can't fill out their visual field form on their driver's license form because sometimes that's the only way that gets them their driver's license is to prove that they have a binocular visual field of at least 60 degrees. And so it takes the technician only an extra 
probably three minutes to do a 3 4 e single binocular visual field, but I would say still one third of the time it comes back without, without it there. So it's just something to remember. It's easy to do. Okay, so now RP genetics. This, uh, this is a disease that can have, as I said, almost any, uh, any inheritance. And so it can range from autosomal dominant. That's about, I don't have the exact number, so you can't quote me on this, but it's reasonably common, probably about 20 or 30 percent of patients coming in have, some, have an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern, which means it's past 50 percent. You can get large families. They'll, they'll know that there are other, a number of cousins, siblings, parents out there. Typically, autosomal dominant is the mildest of the, of the inherited RPs that you'll see. These are patients that function pretty well, maybe driving, but and then really run into problems and functional problems more typically in their 40s and 50s. They know they have the disease, especially since it often runs in the family, but it's, it's not as bad. The autosomal recessive disease, on the other hand, tends to be much worse. They, uh, these are often the kids that are affected in their, in their uh, before age 10 or 12, these uh, recessive means that either their, their, their parents are consanguineous, which here in Utah and Intermountain West is very rare here. If you're gonna, if, for my colleagues that have a lot of Middle Eastern populations, they see this much more. Ours, it, uh, now that we're finally doing genetic testing, we see that there is, some, there is recessive, but it's harder, to, it's harder to do the genetic diagnosis because there's so many different genes that could be that could be involved in recessive disease. X-linked is moderately common here in Utah. That means that it's passed, uh, that, the, that the females generally are not affected, but the males are affected. So it looks like it's skipping various generations. It looks, but if you, but you have to keep that in mind. But we've learned now that we do genetic testing on this, that it's sometimes very hard to distinguish X-linked from autosomal dominant mainly because we know that some women are affected with X-linked disease. It used to be the dogma they never are. <coughs> but we have documented families in my, in my clinic where occasionally a woman will show up with this, and it just has to do with X-linked, and that, the lionization is uneven enough that she's affected uh, when you wouldn't normally expect it to happen. X-linked, also if you look at the women, sometimes you can pick up the carrier state in them. They will have maybe little segments of the retina, seg segmental retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, they may also have mild disease that shows up when they're in their 50s and 60s. They're starting to get a little bit of night blindness. So it's something to at least think about, and we know that there can be, that's, uh, now that we look at this, there are some mix-ups between autosomal dominant and X-linked. Mitochondrial is uncommon in my, uh, in my clinic. They tend to have other neurologic symptoms that go with other other diseases, you know, that, but there are some mitochondrial ones that you will see. Uh, syndromic, as uh, we know, there's things like senior Loken syndrome, other ones that we'll talk about, uh, Usher syndrome, that they can have bardet beetle syndrome. So you do want to ask about other systemic problems, their hearing, those sorts of things. And then finally, probably still, the, the most common disease in my clinic is sporadic, which means we just don't know. There's no known, no known family history. There, they, they may be, in, they could have any of these mutations, then that they may be, uh, if they're autosomal, they could have autosomal dominant, but they're the founder of the disease, of a new line of, uh, of RP. They could be autosomal dominant just with variable penetrance, and only a few patients show up, and that's all that you see within the family. They may be X-linked, again, you know, it may, be, may appear as sporadic, and of course recessive, if you just don't have enough a large enough family that you may not have any known relatives in the with the disease. So with autosomal dominant RP, as I mentioned, the courses uh, can be very mild. There can be variable penetrance. The most common, uh, mu the, and this was the first gene that was found for retinitis pigmentosa, and actually for, for a relatively early finding of any genetic disease is that rhodopsin is one of the most common uh, targets of this disease, most common sources of this. And mutations, uh, you know, and it accounts for maybe 30 or 40 percent of autosomal dominant RP. The most common mutation 
is uh, something called P23H, which uh, is a proline 23H mutation, histidine uh, substitution. It's uh, in some par parts of the country, 30 or 40 percent of, of dominant RP is just that particular mutation. If you go to Europe, the prevalence is zero. It is a disease that is an American disease with an American founder effect. They even know who the founder of the disease is. They've traced that all back. And very interestingly, essentially none of them ever moved to Utah. So I have none. Or I just actually I found the first one or two, and they had moved here from somewhere else to Utah. So it's a pure founder effect. Um, but because it's so common, a lot of people have been studying the disease. They've developed mouse models for this disease. But there are many, many others, and they can affect not only transduction, but a lot of them uh, affect folding of the protein here. They affect, uh, they can be, uh, they can have severe mutations at the site where the, where the vitamin A chromophore binds in. Almost anything can happen. Um, but a lot of them are protein misfolding diseases uh, as in rhodopsin. Another relatively common mutation that we see is in RDS peripherin, which is a structural protein that's involved in formation of the optic disc of the discs. The interesting thing about RDS peripherin is that its manifestations can be very different even within the same family. So you can have classic RP and you can have something that looks like a pattern dystrophy. So again, if you just think about things that look a little atypical and especially if you see other if you've already seen other members in the family that have different looking disease, RDS peripherin is often the culprit. Um, another, set of another set of problems and genetic defects are ciliopathies because of the cilium connecting the rod outer segment and the inner segment is a very complex uh, set of proteins there and there's, about, there's literally dozens of proteins in there that can be affected and once you um, mess up the cilium and affect transport between the rod outer segment and the inner segment or affect structural problems, you can get a retinal degeneration. There are people here like Wolfgang Baer and Jun Yang here that are on our research faculty. That's all they study is ciliopathies. And so, and ciliopathies often tend to be syndromic too, affecting kidneys, affecting hearing, other, other problems that are other ciliated uh, structures in the body. Um, another set of uh, mutations that we often see are splicing factors. And so these are, RNA, these are RNA processing proteins. They're relatively common here in Utah. Why, why that would be true and why it, come, why it affects just the rod cells when these are found in every cell in the body. People, the, the thought is that uh, photoreceptor cells are such specialized cells that they don't have backups, I think. If you have in other cells of the body, in your liver, they've got other splicing factors that can take care of a problem if you have a mutation in a splicing factor. But if you have one in, um, in some of these, like PRPF31, which is one we see a lot here, your retina degenerates. And then, as I also mentioned already, that protein misfolding and a misdirection can cause a lot of problems in the, in the rod cells. And this has to do with the fact that our rod cells don't regenerate. They have to last uh, all our life, and so for 100 years. And so if you've got things that, uh, that cause problems in the cell for, um, oh, and you can have problems that can accumulate over many years. Recessive mutations are relatively uncommon in cult unless you have a lot of high, a high rate of consanguinity. We, we said they're often severe and early onset. And many of the labors congenital amaurosis diseases, which is essentially congenital retinitis pigmentosa, are these recessive diseases. And maybe I don't see so many of them in my clinic, but they probably are in the peds clinics and just aren't seeing them, seeing me. The mutations are often in the transduction cascade and in the visual cycle. So they tend to be more enzymatic problems going on in the eye. And they may, these are the ones that were also first, uh, some of the first digenic diseases were, uh, were re recessive RP. So that's where multiple, um, where you have a mutation in, in one gene and a mutation in a different gene, but somehow they're connected in the pathway and you get enough, uh, enough disruption of the, of the normal pathways within the eye that you, get, uh, that you get cell death. Many of these diseases, when they're first found, when they disrupt the visual cycle, 
They cause high levels of cyclic GMP. There's, uh, there can be accumulations of toxic products within the retina that eventually cause, cause death of the cells. Um, X-linked uh, tends to be a little bit different in that the males are affected. It's usually very severe. A lot of these kids are symptomatic at age seven, eight. It's uh, pretty unfortunate and these patients don't do very well. Uh, females can have mild or late onset. The most common mutations are in RPGR, uh, one of the in, uh, which is obviously found on the X chromosome. But the other one that you need to know about and that shows up on boards is choroideremia, in that it's X-linked. It has a very characteristic pattern here where you see massive choroidal, retinal choroidal atrophy, preservation in the center, and they tend not to have a lot of bone spicules. They tend to have more patchy clumps of pigment seen here. And mitochondrial retinitis pigmentosa is relatively uncommon. Obviously, there's maternal in inheritance. And think of neurologic problems. So think of Kernsayer, Milos, those sorts of things. And then syndromic is usually recessive diseases. Multiple organ systems can be affected. The most common syndromic disease I see in my clinic is going to be Usher syndrome. And they tend to have, the important thing about Usher syndrome is that the hearing loss is usually pretty severe and it's congenital, okay? So try to distinguish it from patients who come in with RP and say, yeah, I have a little bit of a hard time hearing and it's happened in the last five or 10 years. That's probably not Usher syndrome. I can't rule it out. But the most common thing they say, the most common typical Usher's patient has, was diagnosed early on, usually, uh, and they tend to have such severe hearing loss that there's a little bit, there's some changes in their speech. There's other things that you pick up. They may be wearing hearing aids, they may have cochlear implants. So it's, it's more severe, happens almost, and it happens 10 to 20 years before they even develop any vision loss. A Bardet Beetle syndrome, I have a few patients with this, not a lot, but uh, they will tend to be obese. They, they may have mental retardation. They have polydactyly. There's a lot, of, a lot of other issues. I've had one come through relatively recently, but they're, they're not a lot of them. Uh, Senior Loken, uh, Nico can tell you all about that. He's written the, the definitive article on it, I think, and I think on there. And so that's, uh, that they have kidney disease often, and I've often had kidney transplants already. And so there's a few patients in my clinic. And then you get into really rare diseases, Apert's syndrome, Goldman Favre, Refsum disease, gyrate atrophy. You can read about, about them in your book. Most of these I have never ever seen in my life in clinic, and I've been in this practice a long time. So it's, you can think about it, but they, I tried just ruling out another gyrate atrophy this week, and it came back still with a normal ornithine. So it's just the way that, and I've written an article, one of my early papers when I was a resident was on Refsum disease. Never seen it yet. So I created a mouse model, but it didn't doesn't happen very often. And then finally, there's sporadic RP, no family history, and we talk, and you just have to think about other reasons when, it's, when there's no family history. At least consider that this could be a new founder mutation. It could be pseudo-retinitis pigmentosa. It could be an autoimmune retinopathy and really should be in the, in the, um, in the uveitis clinic. Also consider things like CAR and MAR cancer-associated retinopathy for late onset, somewhat atypical disease and uh, as other reasons for this. And then this is where you also think about toxic etiologies. I picked up um, early on when I was on the faculty here, I had a patient that was coming in with ERG abnormalities, other, other things and was referred in from, from, and referred in from the uh, uh, neuro clinic and I saw just a little mar notation of MS-222 as they had done a, a, a toxicology, or just a history of what he was exposed to. And probably none of you have ever heard of MS-222, have you? But I happen to have done, that was one of the things I did my PhD on, is it's a, a, a fish anesthetic that has known toxicity. And he was a fish, uh, a fish pathologist. And what he did is he would take his fish and throw them into a big tank of MS-222, the fish would fall asleep and then he would reach in and grab the fish and then study the fish 
And I asked him, do you ever wear gloves? And he said, of course not. I just reach in and grab the fish. And so through the years, he was chronically ingesting, just like the fish absorb MS-222 through their skin, he was, um, he was absorbing it through his skin too. And I, I just told him, wear some gloves, and he got better. So and we, it was able, we were able to write that up as, a, as an occupational hazard of, the, of the using that, uh, of that career. And then also consider vitamin A deficiency. Uh, some of you may have, I have picked this up. They often have low macular pigment. I, I, I will get that on patients. And vitamin A deficiency will have night blindness, but they will have said that they had, if it's a new onset for them, they, if you take a dietary history, they often are eating something very unusual, or they've had bowel surgery or some other reason why they're malabsorbing. And so it's, it's an easy test to do, and you don't want to miss it because that can be treatable. And then there are stationary retinopathies. There's no clinical progression. Night blindness is prominent, but the visual field is often well-preserved. Uh, this is, and it's diagnosed best by electroretinograms. These patients can be very mildly affected or can have very significant manifestations of the disease. One of the classic ones is fundus albipunctatus, which uh, has all these white dots here, and it's an RDH, retinal dehydrogenase 5 mutation. But the, if you diagnose a stationary retinopathy, the good news is that they, they're not going to get worse. I mean, they may, be, they may be clinically affected, but it's not going to be too, their prognosis is better. In terms of treatment, the patients often want to know about this. But you, so you also, a, 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 when I'm meeting with them and their families, they want to talk a lot. They're going to, you have to allow 15 or 20 minutes or so to talk to them all about what their future is like, what the treatments are like, what we can do. Um, genetic counseling can be very important, and as I said, I, we get, we, I tend to send genetic testing as much as I possibly can. That does mean now that I don't have a genetic counselor, I'm essentially the genetic counselor, which is kind of painful and it takes a lot of time, but uh, you do have to tell them about what risk is for, their, for other children that may, whether they're going to have few kids or whether the parents are still having more, more children. You need to just go through all of that. It's pretty, it's, it's not rocket science genetic counseling though, so we as physicians should be able to do that. Nutrition, they often ask about in my clinics and here in Utah. Basically, we tell them that a healthy diet is important. There is some role of vitamin A. Ta taking high doses of retinoids has been proven in large clinical studies to slow down the disease, but that was slowing down degeneration of the, the tiny little signals on the cone ERG. Clinically, it probably didn't make much difference to these patients. They ask about lutein, zeaxanthin, fish oil. All of those have gone through some studies. Their effects are pretty minor, unfortunately. Um, and then they'll talk about bilberry, coenzyme Q, and just huge numbers of other things. You just have to tell them we don't know what, if that really makes a difference. Uh, gene therapy is coming for certain diseases. In fact, probably within a year, RPE 65 will be approved for genetic for gene therapy. It's uh, it's in injected by a subretinal injection of an adeno associated virus to reintroduce reintroduce the defective gene. We do not have a single patient with RPE 65 here in Utah. We've been looking hard, so we the companies are very disappointed when they say they're all excited to come here. And I say, that's great. We'd be happy to be a site, but I got zero patients for you. And I would know because my PhD was done on RPE65. I'd be watching if anyone came in with that, uh, with that mutation, but we just don't have it. The next gene therapy that's going to be coming, though, is choroideremia. That's probably coming down the line. That we've got plenty of patients for, so it will be happening. The problem is with the number of different genes out there, 40 different gene, at least 40 different genes, hundreds of mutations, every gene is a multi-million dollar project, so there has to be enough funding and enough patient load to actually make it worthwhile. That's, that's the problem with gene therapy. So other people have been looking at more generalized approaches that don't require specific genes. This includes stem cells. There's lots of information and misinformation on the internet about how stem cells is going to cure RP. It's, not, not, it's still a long way off, even for uh, Stargardt disease and other, disease, and other diseases. But you know, you know how technology and science can change. Maybe in five or ten years we'll have 
be able to introduce the cells safely, get them to hook up and do the right thing, but right now they don't. Um, we've been involved in the study using valproic acid, which, is, which had a reputation that it could slow down visual loss. We, it finally required a multi-million dollar study done by the Foundation Fighting Blindness that we participated in, did nothing. Again, it was kind of disappointing, but uh, without those clinical trials, people were putting their patients on VPA. It does have toxic effects, and now we can say VPA does nothing for the disease, at least uh, the way it was done in the trial. Other ones that are being looked at include TUDCA, which is toro ursi deoxycholic acid, so that's a bare bile, a synthetic bare bile uh, derivative. Again, it, there was a lot of hope it would be helping, but I have, it's been going downhill again. And then there's electrostimulation, and our, which is true pseudoscience, but a lot of people are really into that here in Utah. Um, and because you know, people can sell it and, you know, out of their, their acupuncture clinics and, um, and try to help the and at least claim to help the patients. And then artificial vision, which I think we'll be talking about next. Okay, and then artificial vision is the, uh, is the Argus II chip implant. It's very primitive, but uh, it, is, it is approved, and I think we've already had a talk on that earlier, I think at Grand Rounds, when, uh, when Nigel Gregory was here. And we will start offering that to a very limited number of patients, but it's for end-stage disease. They have to be hand motions or worse, I think, maybe even worse than hand motions. But you'll, we have some patients who are already lining up to have this, this done, and it'll be an interesting surgery, five hours to do months of rehabilitation afterwards and a uh, hundred to two hundred thousand dollars so um, then in the last couple minutes we'll cover cone dystrophies there's a wide range of manifestations I see them a lot I find them pretty the a, a lot of them are these atypical macular cone dystrophies we don't have good genes for them it's hard to predict how the how the disease how they're how much they're going to progress there are uh, some of them, obviously the most common cone dystrophy we see is color is X-linked color blindness. 3% of the male population has that problem, but uh, that's, a stationary, that's a stationary disease. It's really the progressive ones that may happen. In the severe cases, you can get achromatopsia, but that's relatively uncommon. And then uh, the cone dystrophy signs and symptoms include loss of color vision, loss of central visual acuity, they tend to be much more photophobic than RP patients. Uh, they tend to, if pure cone dystrophy, they may have preservation of their visual field. And they often have nystagmus and bullseye maculopathies if they're, if they're really severe. And the way we diagnose cone dystrophies is just like RP, you know, with clinical history, family history, dilated examination, full field electroretinogram, and multifocal may also be very useful in these patients. And it's important, again, my technicians tend to forget about co doing color vision testing, but that's how we pick up some of these. And genetic testing is moderately good, not nearly as good as retinitis pigmentosa, but we can send those out. And similar, similarly, the, the, we're looking at uh, gene therapy, stem cells. There's even some companies that are trying to develop gene therapy for, uh, for just regular um, co uh, color blindness in males. What that, that one is a little bit questionable whether you want to put, you know, pretty normal eyes under, uh, have them undergo gene therapy, but it is coming. And then I think the last thing, we'll just go through a few slides. Always remember that these could be toxic effects and you want to keep that in your mind. There are numerous agents that can have toxicity. Often they will develop these crystalline deposits in, or they will have signs that are just atypical like crystalline deposits, this is canthazanthin maculopathy. Uh, lutein maculopathy will be in the news in two days because that will be uh, our first case of that uh, has been, is going to be published in JAMA Ophthalmology. Um, and so that's, that's a possibility. The um, tamoxifen, we published one report here of tamoxifen deposits. Again, they're crystalline deposits. That tends to give you macular holes, so other maculopathies can give you problems. And then don't forget things like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. That's why you do a drug history of what they've been taking. Tobacco, alcohol, amb amblyopia, ephambutol, all of these other things can cause 
problems that can be confused with inherited retinal diseases and can be potentially treated by just, by just uh, changing their toxic exposure. And then other things that we see, digitalis toxicity, is I think less common, I don't, but that color, uh, just because it's not used so much, but that can cause disturbance of color vision. Uh, Viagra and similar compounds, they definitely can cause some color vision problems. They are contraindicated, or at least patients with RP sometimes ask, can I take Viagra? And the answer is, it's probably okay unless you happen to have the same mutation in the phosphodiesterase pathway but it's something to at least be careful about in those patients. And then there's th other things like amiodarone and methanol that you just want to consider. So I think, oh, and then the last thing is remember, not everything that looks like RP is RP. It can be post-inflammatory, post-traumatic, um, and it used to be, you're not seeing it so much anymore, but when I was, when I was a resident, we still would see a rubella retinopathy because people, rubella wasn't, was a disease of the 1950s, and some of those patients would come in with salt and pepper retinopathies and other changes. So, the clues are that they don't that they're they may uh, be unilateral, they may be atypical, they may have relatively little symptom symptomatology. They may not have night blindness, even though they have something that looks like this. They tend to have more of a salt and pepper configuration. They have atypical electrophysiology and visual fields. And they may, you know, the rubella ones, often they were deaf at the same time, but they didn't have Usher syndrome. So I think that's it. So any, any questions at this point? Yes. For the, for the one patient you were talking about, or patients who were interested in the Viagra, yeah. they had a phosphodiesterous uh, mutation. Or they, there may be a phosphodiesterous mutation. Do you recommend gene therapy before you, or gene testing? Um, I haven't ever picked up a mutation. You know, I think that I'm going to tell them it's rare. You know, the main thing I guess you would worry about is it's inhibiting other visual pathways and affecting the visual symptoms or the visual pathways. So in a patient who already has compromise, you basically just have to tell them take the lowest dose, and if you notice any symptoms, you probably should stop. I think that. The chance that I'm going to pick up a phosphodiesterase uh, deficiency in one of my patients is going to be less than one percent. So, you know, it's not it's not attacking the same pathway. All right. Well, very good. Uh -huh.